songbooks and turn to page number 125. We're going to be singing the Solid Rock. Welcome to Sure Foundation Baptist Church. If you could find your seats and grab your green or red songbook and turn to page number 125, we're going to be singing the Solid Rock. <clears throat> Song 125, let's sing it on the first. My hope is built on nothing less than Jesus' blood and righteousness. I dare not trust the sweetest frame, but wholly lean on Jesus' name. On Christ the solid rock I stand, all other ground is sinking sand. Sand. When darkness veils his lovely face, I rest on his unchanging grace. In every high and stormy gale, my anchor holds within the veil. On Christ the solid rock I stand, all other ground is sinking sand. All other ground is sinking sand. His oath is covenant, his blood support me in the whelming flood. When all around my soul gives way, he then is all my hope and stay. On Christ the solid rock I stand, all other ground. Sinking sand, all other ground is sinking sand. When he shall come with trumpet sound, oh, may I then in him be found, dressed in his righteousness alone, faultless to stand before the throne. On Christ the solid rock I stand, all other ground is sinking sand. All other ground is sinking sand. Amen. Good seeing you. Brother Jim, would you open us a word of prayer? Amen. Our second song is be song number 56, When We All Get to Heaven. <clears throat> song number 56, When We All Get to Heaven. Song 56, let's sing it together on that first verse. Sing the wondrous love of Jesus. Sing his mercy and his grace. In the mansions bright and blessed, He'll prepare for us a place. When we all get to heaven, what a day of rejoicing that will be. When we all see Jesus, we'll sing and shout the victory. Whoa, whoa, whoa. I don't know how you guys do things where you're from, but for that short foundation, we usually shout on the shout the victory part right there. Let's sing it so loud that we overrun that stupid protest out there. Let's sing it out on the second. While we walk the pilgrim pathway, clouds will overspread the sky. But when traveling days are over, not a shadow, not a sign. When we all get to heaven, what a day of rejoicing that will be. When we all see Jesus, we'll sing and shout the victory. Much better on the third. Let us then be true and faithful, trusting, serving every day. Just one glimpse of Him in glory will the toils of life repay. When
when we all get to heaven what a day of rejoicing that will be when we all see jesus we'll sing and shout the victory onward to the prize before us soon his beauty will be whole soon the pearly gates will open we shall tread the streets of gold when we all get to heaven what a day of rejoicing that will be when we all see jesus we'll sing and shout the victory amen good scene with that we'll have our announcements final day of our King James Conference and of course it isn't without excitement so um, as far as uh, well, well if you need a bulletin we're gonna go through the bulletin but if you need a bulletin would you just lift up your hand one of the ushers will bring you a bulletin I'll address uh, the animals outside here in just a minute but uh, the beast of Corinth anyway uh, our verse of the week is where the word of a king is, there is power. And who may say unto him, what doest thou? Ecclesiastes chapter 8, verse 4. Of course, uh, our the King James Conference is celebrating. It's actually been 412 years as of this month. That's why I chose to have uh, the conference on the anniversary month of the King James actually coming out in 1611. So uh, that's kind of what we're doing. We just want to you know, make sure that we're bringing forth the truth of God's word, the King James Bible, and uplifting it. And uh, so I hope everything's been good for you guys as far as the conference goes. We've had a, a great attendance. I know we've had some people getting sick. So um, hopefully that uh, the, the plague is, is, is going to end or be stopped at some point. So um, as far as our service times, this morning is 1030 a.m. for our preaching service. We're going to have Pastor Joe Jones from Shield of Faith Baptist Church preaching, and uh, he's preaching a, a unique sermon about the Omos. So, we'll, uh, I'm, I'm looking forward to that. And uh, so we are gonna have a and A afterwards. I just wanna make sure that if you have a question for Pastor Jones, that uh, you get that question as soon as possible. Because once, once the interview starts, once the Q&A starts, then it's gonna be probably too late to to get your questions in on paper, but we might take a couple uh, people just, you know, from the crowd or whatever. It, it kind of depends on how much time it's going to take because we're scheduled to have 12:30 lunch and we're scheduled to have 1:30 soul winning. So, of course, they tapped into our internet and shut our internet down. There was a person out there. We caught a person out there tapping into our internet. So, it's not going to be live streamed, unfortunately, but uh, we are going to record everything. So.
baby room or moms in the dad baby room during the church services please watch your children at all times especially with those filthy freaks out there um they just are groomers right but uh just just pay attention where your kids are things can get kind of 
you know with this many people in here things can get uh, crazy so just make sure you're keeping an eye on your children and don't let them go upstairs to those bathrooms on their own if, the, if they need to use if you need to use the bathrooms upstairs you're more than welcome to do so but don't let your little children climb up those stairs and go up there by themselves please escort them uh, as parents and then if you want to escort to your vehicles the ushers are available to do that for you if you're just a single lady here and especially since we got those uh, filthy homos out there um, if you want somebody to walk you to your car one of the ushers are available to do that for you they're the guys with the pins that say usher on them and uh, I think that's all we have for announcements besides the fact that it's today what's the date today is it 28th okay 28th tomorrow's brother steven's birthday so make sure you wish him a happy birthday and i think that's all we have for announcements and we're, now we're going to just get right into the sword drills here i know that's been a long announcement but uh we're going to get into the sword drills for day four so all the kids are already ready can we get the uh, so a couple of the ushers to grab the prizes from out of the back now remember you guys can put your bibles down for just a second i don't want to get you cramps but um so we do have prizes in there but the big bibles and the big like nerf guns and stuff those are for those that win the grand prize for the day now the the competition for um for the sword drills so today will be the last time or this service will be the last time for the so we'll have two winners today in the adult group and the, in the children's group and then tonight when i do the the final one it's going to be all the winners from the previous services and so it won't be for everybody it'll just be for the people that won the previous services and uh, those people will face off against each other and so they'll they'll be the only ones standing and going to the verses so it'll kind of get like pinpointed to those particular people but we do still have many carnal uh, prizes over here we got the food and then uh, we do have some some uh, toys and such and then uh, some books but there's spiritual books too um, in that so the black tote is only for those that win the the, the whole thing today um, at this service and then at the end um, there'll be a gift card for each winner and then also you can pick a big prize out of the box so everybody understand okay good all right so kids are you ready all right they're ready so the first the first verse is Psalm 119 98 Psalm 119 98 I need judges in the back are you ready set go Jack Good job. All right, second one. Exodus 20, verse 1. Exodus 20, verse 1. Ready? Go! Exodus 20, verse 1. BB. That's right. Good job. I thought somebody would have that memorized. <laughs> Good job, BB. All right. Next one, Joshua 1, 8. Joshua 1, 8. Ready? Go. Gabe? All right, good job. All right, next verse is Genesis 13, 13. Genesis 13, 13. Ready, go. BB? <laughs> good job. <laughs> I don't know what I, I these verses just came to mind as I was <laughs> thinking about things last night. So Hebrews chapter 1 verse 2. You guys got the Bibles up? Hebrews chapter 1 verse 2. Ready? Go. Go. 
Amen. Good job. This is one hopefully you might have memorized here. It's going to be 1 John 5, 7. 1 John 5, 7. Ready? Go. Who do you got? Liberty by a hair? Okay, go ahead. All right, good job. She got two points. I might have already done this one before, but this is just going to be a speed thing. John 1, 1. Don't stand up before I say it. John 1, 1. All right, I really need the judges. Ready, set. Oh, ho, 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 ho. I changed up the cadence. Ready, set. Get out of here. Ah. <laughs> Ready, set. Goat. Oh, I didn't say go. <laughs> Ready? <laughs> Set. Go. I saw, I thought Gabe did, but who, what do you guys say? What'd you say? Okay, so Liberty. They overrule me. All right, job. All right, well, Liberty's got two point, or four points now, so she just needs one to win. Here's another one that should be a memorized verse, but we'll see what happens, all right? You've got your Bibles up. Don't give up, kids. You can come from behind. All right, Romans chapter 4, verse 5. Romans chapter 4, verse 5. Ready, set, go. Gabe? Okay, who was the next one to stand up? Jack, go ahead. Good job. Somehow this one stayed in there, but uh, we'll do it again anyway because it makes it go faster. All right, Titus 1-2. Titus 1, 2. You got your Bibles up? Ready, set, go. I got Liberty because Gabe went a little early. Liberty, go ahead. All right, good job. All right, now on to the adults, and there's a perfect one, a verse for you guys. You should, a lot of the people in here probably already know. But Liberty, go ahead. Liberty goes first. All right. But you guys can come. You guys can come. Just don't crowd her. She's the winner. Uh, you can pick one, anything out of that box, yeah. And then three other or four other prizes. The black box is only for the person that won the whole thing today. Okay. All right. While the kids are collecting the spoils of war. <laughs> We're gonna go ahead and go on with the men and, and women, uh, 13 and up. So, all right, this is your chance to get into the finals. Are you ready? Hurry, kids, hurry. Romans 1, 32. Romans 1, 32. Ready? Go. Yeah, go ahead. Amen. That's right. That was an easy one. I was kidding. <laughs> Good job. Okay, so the next one is Joel. You ready? Joel 2.28. Joel 2.28. Ready? Go. Johnny. All right, good job. Oh, sorry. <laughs> sorry. All right, good job. Thank you. <laughs> I jumped the gun there. Sorry. All right. Zechariah chapter 14, verse 4. Zechariah chapter 14, verse 4. Ready, go. Daniel. 
Oh, uh, Justin. No, oh, no, it's not. You're not even, why do I keep forgetting your name? I'm sorry. You're Robert. I'm sorry. Why do I keep calling you Justin? Sorry. And his feet shall stand in that day upon the Mount of Olives, which is before Jerusalem on the east, and the Mount of Olives shall cleave in the midst thereof toward the east and toward the west, and there shall be a great valley, a very great valley, and half of the mountain shall remove toward the north and half of it toward the south. All right. Good job. Okay. Romans chapter 12, verse 1. Romans chapter 12, verse 1. Ready, go. Christian. I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable before God, which is your reasonable service. Is that right? You missed on two, but that's okay. You still get one point. So, all right, good job. Good try. It's hard when you're on the spot, though, so. All right, next one is Psalm 23, verse 4. Bible's up. Psalm 23, verse 4. Ready? Go. Moses. Amen. Good job. It comforted me last night. <laughs> All right, here we go. Next one. Bible's up. Romans chapter 12, verse number 2. Romans chapter 12, verse number 2. Ready? Go. Go ahead. Be not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind, that you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. I think that's right. Yeah. Good job. So you got four points. He's like, I'm not going to get beat today. All right, next one. We have 1 Corinthians 15. 1 Corinthians 15, verse 58. 1 Corinthians 15, 58. Go. But be steadfast, unmovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord. So can someone check that? 1 Corinthians Yeah, it, it, yeah, that's okay. You do, good try. Go ahead. Therefore, my beloved brethren, be steadfast, unmovable, always abounding the work of the Lord, for as much as you know that your labor is not in vain in the Lord. Yeah, that's right. That's the rest of it. Good job, though. <laughs> if you would have just got like one word wrong or something, I would have, I would have let you have the point. But it's this is for the this is for the to get into the finals here. So, anyway, uh, let's see. We got Galatians one eight. Galatians 1 8. Ready? Go. Bill? That's right. All right. Ephesians chapter 6, verse 1. Ephesians chapter 6, verse 1. Ready? Go. Moses. Oh, he was still, you got it? I have it. Children, obey your parents in the Lord, for this is right. All right. Good job. Next one is Judges, are you ready? Proverbs 11.30. Proverbs 11.30. Ready? Go. <laughs> Robert, right? That's what I got, too. All right, good job. So who's got, so does he have four points now or? Three, okay, and you have four. All right. Next one is Daniel 9, verse 27. Daniel 9, verse 27. Go. Moses. Good job. So Moses has three points, right? Moses, you got three? Yeah. Okay. Next one is Philippians 3 2. Philippians 3 2. Go. Oh, beware of. Yeah, go ahead. Uh, I don't 
It didn't flow as the King James. Oh, you got it. All right, good job. That's it. Come on up and get your prize. And then anybody else that got one from the three boxes here. But that's the big prize box, right? Anybody else that got them? Come on up. So you, you got two or three? So go ahead and pick three out of there. Three out of here. Good job, guys. All right, so I got to mark where I was left. Has anybody got a pen on them right here? Buried. All right, so we'll continue on with that afterwards. Let's go ahead and sing another song, and then we'll receive the offering, and then we'll have the Bible reading. Come on up. <laughs> All right, our next song is be song number 150, My Faith Has Found a Resting Place. Song number 150, My Faith Has Found a Resting Place. <clears throat> Song 150, let's sing it out together on the first. My faith has found a resting place, not in device nor creed. I trust the ever-living one, his wounds for me shall plead. I need no other argument, I need no other plea. It is enough that Jesus died, and that he died for me. Enough for me that Jesus saves, this ends my fear and doubt. A sinful soul, I come to him, he'll never cast me out. I need no other argument, I need no other plea. It is enough that Jesus died and that he died for me. My heart is leaning on the word, the written word of God. Salvation by my Savior's name, salvation through his blood. I need no other argument, I need no other plea. It is enough that Jesus died and that he died for me. My great physician heals the sick, the lost he came to save. For me his precious blood he shed, for me his life he gave. I need no other argument, I need no other plea. It is enough that Jesus died and that he died for me. Amen. Good team. Brother Sean, would you bless the offering for us?
All right, go ahead and turn to Psalms, Psalm chapter 100. Psalm 100. If you don't have a Bible, there should be a Bible under the seat in front of you. If not, you can raise your hand and one of the ushers will bring you one. Psalm 100. Psalm 100, the Bible reads, Make a joyful noise unto the Lord, all ye lands. Serve the Lord with gladness. Come before his presence with singing. Know ye that the Lord is, that the Lord he is God. It is he that hath made us, and not we ourselves. We are his people, and the sheep of his pasture. Enter into his gates with thanksgiving, and into his courts with praise. Be thankful unto him, and bless his name. For the Lord is good, his mercy is everlasting, and his truth endureth to all generations. Brother Drew, will you pray for us? Right. Amen. Well, I've been sitting over there wondering if I start off with an apology or the thank you. So then I realized um, all this is Brother Dylan's fault <laughs> or Jason. I mean, either one. So there's plenty of people here to blame. And, and I like to blame Brother Dylan for the uh, show outside. I think that's the wise thing to do. So, but now seriously, I, I'm uh, very grateful for meeting all of you, and, and again, well, at least most of you. So if I haven't met you, come up and say hi afterwards. Um, definitely glad to be here. This place brings back a lot of memories for me and my family. You know, we're driving around town. I'm like, oh, I remember that apartment complex eight years ago where somebody yelled at me. You know, it's just, it's just crazy how <laughs> <laughs> this place, yeah, there's nothing new under the sun, apparently. And so, uh, but definitely great. I want to thank Pastor Thompson and Sherry for putting on this event. The hospitality, everything uh, looks great. I'm really excited to be here. I've been blessed so far, and I hope to bless you guys this morning. So during the announcements, Pastor Thompson was talking about my subject, and he mentioned the word OMO. So I'm just going to explain to you what that is. Okay, I'm preaching about this concept called original manuscript onlyism. Original manuscript onlyism. I also like to use the term modern version onlyism. The reason why I'm preaching about this, and this is something that just really gets me fired up, is because of the constant attacks, the constant mockery. Oh, you're King James only? You're so narrow. You're so narrow minded. There's a broad, vast, you know, other truth out there that you're not embracing. You know, what does the Bible say about the broad way that leadeth to destruction? You know, and I always just like to make it a point to let people know, hey, your church is something only. Okay, think about this. Your church is something only. You're either truth only. You either believe that God preserved the word of God or you don't. Your falsehood only. Your original manuscript only. So these people, you know, sitting back and just mocking us like, you know, I'm walking in here today and this freak's like, you know, the King James Bible's outdated. There's way better versions just like there's way better churches you could go to this morning. Think about that. You got this freak show out there and that's what these people are saying. And then you've got hundreds and hundreds of churches saying the exact same thing. What does that mean? You know what that means? The OMO is two-thirds of the way to becoming a homo. <laughs> Seriously, you, you know, once you cross that line and you become of that, that's your position, you're born after that, you're settled in, you're an original manuscript only. So that, that's your position. You're a James White, you're a Jeff Durbin, you're one of these types of people, look, you're one letter away from crossing over and adding the H, okay? I mean, it had, that's what it is. And that's one of the things that really bothers me about this, okay? You know, on the back of our church invites, we have, you know, just some information about our church, you know, and we're King James only. And I just got a little, you know, paragraph underneath there to let people know, your church is something only. So don't mock us and don't say, 
I can't believe you're King James only. Well, guess what? Your original manuscript only. Because if you endorse the modern versions, essentially what you're saying is, I only believe that truth is preserved in the original manuscripts. And that's what we're going to talk about this morning. Psalm chapter 100, let's get into this. Look at verse number 5. The Bible says this, For the Lord is good. His mercy is everlasting. Let's stop right there. How is it that his mercy, we're told in the Bible, is everlasting, but his word isn't? Look at the rest of the verse. And his truth endureth to all generations. Is there a generation here this morning? That's easy. It's obvious. So what does that mean? What is the Bible saying about itself? Well, if there's still generations, then apparently there's still truth. His truth endureth, it lasts to all generations. And that's what I'm going to definitely be hammering home this morning. Now, I titled this sermon, I, I included a Japanese word. I spent about a total of a year over in Japan. And there's a word that's very versatile, and it's called domo. And one of the, the, the ways you can use this is like basically by saying thanks. And so I titled this, No Domo for the Omo. So... <laughs> <laughs> no thanks for the original manuscript only. They have done absolutely zero for God. Right, don't let these people tell you, oh, you know, we're, we're serving God over here in this church. We're, we're, we're still serving God. No, you're not. You're the reason for that show outside. It's because of you and your leadership that that's allowed to take place. And I hate it with an extreme passion. Uh, turn to Psalm chapter 119. 119. So this morning, I want to show you how this position that people take leads to the erosion of authority. And I also hope to give you some simple arguments, some simple things to, to, to help people. Okay, Because obviously that's the first thing we want to do. I don't want you to think that I knock on someone's door and they're like, Oh, you're King James only, and I'm just like blasting them like I am right now, okay? No, I, I want to help people. I wanna, we want to convert people to the truth, right? That, that's, that's the first and foremost thing that we're about. We want to get them saved. We want to get them corrected. We want to get them on board with truth. Why? Because we need the help. The kingdom of God needs the help, okay? So we're going to answer several questions this morning, okay? We're going to talk about a lot of different things, but the main thing is understanding that there are only two positions in this world. If English isn't your first language, doesn't matter. You're either truth only or you are falsehood only. There's only two positions. Don't let them try to cloud you with, oh, the ESV, the NIV. No, your original manuscript only. That is what you are. You are modern version only. You are either truth or you are into falsehood. And that is what it is. And so let me just give you the intent also of this sermon, what I hope to, to pass on to you. So it's been said that you've got your flame and yawn, you've gotten your lobster. Pastor Matt said you got your, your, your broccoli, we got our vegetables yesterday. Well, let me show you what I'm trying to give you to add to that. Psalm chapter 119, look at verse 104. The Bible says, through thy precepts, okay, so through thy precepts, through applying the word of God in my life, through actually reading and being a doer of the word. So through thy precepts, I get understanding. Okay? And that's my goal is to give you some understanding. But also, look what it says. It says, therefore, I hate every false way. So my goal and the main purpose of me preaching this this morning to you is to serve up a plate of hate. Okay? <laughs> that's what it is. You say, what am I supposed to walk away with this morning? I want to serve up a plate of hate. I want to take you wherever you're at right now on this subject and just cause you to either break the meter or just go up in anger towards the original manuscript movement, these omos, okay? That is my goal. Turn to 1 Corinthians chapter number 2. 1 Corinthians chapter number 2. So I went to Christianity.com because it was the easiest to grab. And uh, I, I was just kind of looking around at what they say about modern Bible versions. And they have this question. Why so many translations? And let me just read this to you. Why so many translations? And here's their answer. 
because the translation process has a certain amount of subjectivity. It is helpful to be able to compare different translations in order to get the best feel for what the original languages expressed. As newer English translations are able to reflect our ever-changing language. Ooh, Pastor Anderson smashed that on Friday. Right? I mean, but think about what they're saying here. They're saying that the reason for all these broad versions, these 450 plus modern English Bible versions, is because of something called subjectivity, okay? Which basically means the quality of being based on or influenced by personal feelings you know, taste or opinion, something like that. So they're saying because the translators of any version of the Bible are, uh, they, they have their own opinions, they're biased in this, that we need to constantly update the Word of God. Okay, and what they obviously mean by that is change with the times, change with the course of the world. Of course, they're not saying that, but that's what they mean. Okay, and what you're going to see over and over and over again this morning, what the original manuscript only movement does is it takes man and puts him up here and it puts God down here. Okay, I mean, you know, this as above, so below type thing, you know, the Baphomet statue, who's ever seen that? You know, that's basically what you should think of when you hear the original manuscript only movement because that's exactly what they are doing. And so... Uh, to, to, to kind of move on here, I just want to lay a foundation of, just, just, just before we get started here, I just want to lay a foundation of what I call like the grouping of twos, okay? So we've already talked about this. You've got falsehood. You've got truth, right? We have the King James Only Movement. That's what we call this, King James Only Conference. You have the original manuscript onlyists, or the omos as I call them. And you know, you only have literally two religions in the world. And I know you guys have heard this, okay? You have what I like to call the religion of human achievement. You take any ism that's out there, okay? I don't care, Mormonism, Satanism, Communism, Socialism, you know, the, I, I don't care what it is, okay? Their main teaching is do or, or doing, okay? That's what they push. What are you doing to achieve salvation, to achieve your, li your, your, your liberty, Okay, so in other words, what they teach and what they push is the gospel of probation. Okay, it's not, they don't teach salvation. The religion of human achievement teaches probation. And they say, what are you doing right now to be saved? You, everybody in here knows what probation is. It's a period of good behavior under supervision. And isn't it interesting that the religion of human achievement, and this is a encompasses the vast majority of professing Christianity, isn't it interesting that they flock to the original manuscript ideology. They flock to the modern versions and they shun the King James Bible. Okay, So you're going to see how that all fits together. And the reason why I like to simplify this is because I've found it to be very helpful out soul winning. You know, I've just basically defined what I just defined for you to people and they're like, wow, you know, that really makes a lot of sense. You know, because people have these questions. You know, they don't know what's going on. They don't, they don't understand what the Bible says. You just knocked on their door, and they have all these questions. Well, how do you know that the Jehovah Witnesses aren't right, or the Mormons, or the Seventh-day Adventists, or the Catholics? It's like, hey, they're all the same. They all teach that you have to do something in order to be saved. Atheism, same thing. It doesn't matter. That's the, the religion of the world. And then there's the other religion which is from the Word of God, which is what I like to call divine accomplishment, meaning God accomplished what we could not. He died on the cross, paid the sin debt of the entire world. And what's the message of Christianity? What's the message of divine accomplishment? Done versus do. Yeah. Okay, that's what it is. Done versus do. And isn't it interesting that the Bible teaches salvation as opposed to probation? And isn't it interesting that those of us who hold to that flock to the King James Bible? We believe, well, God obviously in the Bible said that he would preserve his truth unto all generations. And so that's what it is. We believe that. We hold to that. We recognize that. It's simple. It's not confusing. It's narrow. It's straight. And that is what I want to drive home. Now, we looked at this verse yesterday, but let's look at it again. 1 Corinthians chapter 2, look at verse number 12. So the Bible says this, 
Now we have received not the spirit of the world. Okay? What you have to understand is the religion of human achievement is driven by the spirit of the world. Okay, but look what he says next. But the spirit which is of God, that we might know the things that are freely given to us. Salvation is freely given to us. And you're going to see those words come up a few times this morning. Okay, like in regards to the scriptures, they are freely given to us. Okay, go to Ephesians chapter number two. So again, very clear in that verse, there are two spirits. There is the spirit of the world, which fits perfectly with the religion of human achievement. Then there is the spirit of God, which is obviously the spirit of truth. Okay, it's the Holy Ghost. It's the, the spirit of God, which is the spirit of our religion, our truth, what we hold to. Let's talk about the spirit of the world just for a second. Ephesians chapter two, look at verse number two. So Paul says this, wherein time past ye walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that now worketh in the children of disobedience. And what you will definitely see this morning is that these original manuscript onlyists, these omos, they are not just... Um, confused people that are kind of lost, they're doing severe damage to the kingdom of God. They're literally attacking God. They're literally attacking us. And I'm not calling you to take up arms or, or to make this physical. This is obviously a spiritual uh, a warfare. Go to John chapter number four. Okay? But what we have to understand is that that religion, the religion of human achievement, which embraces the modern versions, which embraces the original manuscript only idea, is driven by the prince of the power of the air. In other words, Satan. That's what it is. Okay? Now, what about the Spirit of God? John chapter number four, very famous passage. Jesus is talking with the woman at the well, the Samaritan woman. And look what he says in verse 21. Jesus saith unto her, Woman, believe me, the hour cometh when ye shall neither in this mountain nor yet in Jerusalem worship the Father. Verse 22. Okay, so he's talking about the worship then, but the worship in the future. Verse 22. Ye worship, ye know not what. We know what we worship, for salvation is of the Jews. Okay, and of course, at that time, the southern kingdom of Judah, which is just basically a, a province of the Roman government, they had the oracles of God. They had the truth. They had the word of God. Okay? Look at verse 23. But the hour cometh, and now is, when the true worshipers... Okay, what, what does he say? But the hour cometh, and now is, when the true worshipers shall worship the Father in spirit and and in truth. I want you to remember that statement. Shall worship the Father in spirit and in truth. For the Father seeketh such to worship Him. So Jesus is saying, hey, the hour cometh. The time is coming. And He said this, what, 2,000 something years ago? The hour cometh and now is when the true worshipers shall Worship the Father in spirit and truth. Okay, He's talking, obviously in His time, but also in future tense. In meaning that in the future, guess what? His truth endures to all generations. Okay? That means it's always going to be this way. God is seeking people to worship Him in spirit and in truth. And, and we were talking about this yesterday, where... You know, there's definitely going to be some overlapping verses that I'm going to use this morning that I've already used, that Pastor Men has used, maybe Pastor Anderson used, maybe Pastor Shelley used. I'm going to use some verses that I'm sure Pastor Thompson might use this evening. Okay? And that doesn't bother me. That shouldn't bother any of us. Because the moment that Pastor Thompson decided to put this conference on, you know, you have to understand, you have saved people coming together and, and this, the, the Spirit works in us. Okay, and I believe that God just laid this on my heart, laid every message on the heart of every preacher who's been here to, 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 to hammer home certain things. Okay, and so that's the reason for some of the overlap because it's not like we all get together and say, okay, I'm going to use this verse, so don't use this. You know, we, we don't do that. We don't even talk about it. 
Okay? So just, just keep that in mind. Look at verse 24. It says, God, so Jesus says, God is a spirit, and they that worship him. Look what this next word is, must. That's mandatory. That is obligatory. Must. That is a commandment. This is not optional. Must. Worship him in spirit and in truth. Okay, the reason why I'm talking like this is because I'm going to read for you guys a couple of examples from the mouths of an original manuscript only. And these things are not new. I'm sure many of you have heard these things. I took two churches, just two random churches, just within a half mile of ours, and I copied and pasted their statement of faith. Okay, and you can, what I'm about to read to you, you can find anywhere around here. This is nothing new, but just listen to this. So this, this, uh, a statement of faith is from a church called Oasis City Church in Boise. Kind of a new one. And it says this about the Bible. We believe that both the Old Testament and New Testament are the infallible word of God in all matters of life and doctrine. And the Bible is completely relevant for every area of the human experience because it is living and active that the Bible is the exclusive and only authority for faith and lifestyle. Sounds, sounds all right. I mean, if you didn't know what church it was, you'd be like, oh, okay, that sounds good. It sounds like they believe the Bible. The next sentence, and that the original autographs are without error. The original autographs are without error. Hold that word into your mind, autographs. Why did they use that? Why did they choose that word? It is to, believe, uh, it is to be believed, practiced, trusted, blah, blah, blah. Okay? So they say all this nice stuff about the Word of God. It's perfect. It's infallible. They say, and, and that the original autographs are without error. Interesting. Here's another one. One more, and we're going to put these two things together. So you got that word, autograph. Okay, they say the original autographs are without error. Here's um, Treasure Valley Bible Church. Not to be confused with Sam Gipps Treasure Valley Baptist Church. Not that I'm endorsing that. I'm just making that distinction because they sound the same and we get them mixed up all the time. Okay, they say this right out off, right off the gate. The Bible in its original manuscripts. The Bible in its original manuscripts. So you have one church saying autographs. You have this church saying manuscripts. That means something is inspired by God. The Bible in its original manuscripts is inspired by God. It was not written by an act of human will. It was not written by an act of human will. What is the it? The it, according to them, is the original manuscripts. Okay? But men moved by the Holy Spirit spoke from God. God's word is profitable for teaching, uh, for reproof, correction, and training in righteousness. It fully equips the believer for every good work. For further discussion, see the paper of the authority and sufficiency of God's word. No thanks, you already pissed me off enough. <laughs> so you take that word autographs. Okay, what is an autograph? Why well, you're probably thinking it's a signature. Here's the definition. Just listen to this. A signature, especially that of a celebrity, written as a memento for an admirer. Okay? The key thing about the autographs is it, uh, it highlights handwritten. Okay, that, that's why they're using that word. They want you to understand implicitly handwritten. Okay, that's, that's the, the whole thing. And, and, and when you talk to these people sometimes, they say, well, we're giving credence and we're, we're giving honor to God's word because we use autograph and he's like our celebrity. Okay, and so therefore we believe that his originals could only be inspired. What's the definition of a manuscript? What's a written or typewritten composition or document as distinguished from a printed copy? So without telling you directly, without telling you explicitly, they're telling you implicitly that they only believe, and understand, this is the prevailing attitude out there. This is what probably 98, 99% of professing Christianity believes or are sucked into. They believe that it's only the handwritten originals that have any inspiration, that are true scripture, that are without error. Because that's what they both said. And you can go get the phone book and just close your eyes and point to a church. 
and unless you land on this one or a couple other Baptist churches in the area, I don't know, you're more than likely going to land on a church that holds this position. Now, what does this mean? What are they really trying to say? What they're trying to say is that only the original handwritten documents have authority and are without error. Turn to Matthew chapter number 28. And understand that authority is power. Authority means power. If you have authority, you have power to influence. You have power to change. So if we don't have Scripture, if we don't have God's perfect preserved words, if we don't have what He actually said, it's subjective. It's been messed up by translators, but we've got a pretty good idea. But we need to keep an open mind in case the scholars dig something up next week. Right? Then guess what? That takes away our power. That takes away our ability to do anything meaningful for God. Because why would you want to go put your whole life, all your eggs in this basket, if it's not from God? If it's not necessarily true? If you have to constantly question it? You see what that does? That highlights man. Now you have to go to the man to get your truth. Now you have to go to man because he's got to tell you what should be in this, in this and what this should say or shouldn't say. Well, this manuscript doesn't have the last part of Mark chapter 16, so I won't read it. I've been in churches like that. I don't know why, but <laughs> I, I, I've heard that with my own ears. My whole family has. But what else is that? What does that mean? Well, that means you're Catholic. You're Catholic. Who has the ultimate authority in the Catholic religion? It's the papacy. It's the Pope. Well, what about the Mormon religion? It's the Quorum of Twelve Apostles. What about the Jehovah Witnesses? It's the Watchtower Society. The Seventh Days. I mean, pick one. It is man above God. That's what this is. And that's what we need to get mad about. And that's what we need to go take and start pushing back with. And letting people know, hey, you're exalting man. Your statement of faith is junk. It's blasphemy is what it is. That's what you're about to see. It is extreme blasphemy. Listen to this. So you're at Matthew 28. I'm going to read for you Matthew 6, 13. So as the Lord's teaching the Sermon on the Mount, teaching how to pray. The last part of it says this, Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Why would Jesus say that if he only meant that in the original manuscripts? So could you imagine he's teaching this? And he's like, okay, write this down. Who, who wrote this down first? Okay, well, that's <laughs> only that's good. And then everybody else after that, just good luck. They do this, again, not only to bring God down, but to bring you and me on an even playing field with them. And we're not going to let that happen. Matthew 28, look at verse 18. And Jesus came and spake unto them, saying, All power is given unto me in heaven and in earth. You know what that means? That means that man, and you're going to see this when we go to Exodus, man does not have the power to stifle, to block the word of God. Amen. Think about what they're saying. They're saying that man's more powerful than God. That's, without saying it, that's what they're saying. And that should bother everybody, I think, just as much as that. Amen. The same, just as much as that. Jesus says right here, all power is given unto me in heaven and in earth. We are in the earth. He has all the power in here. Why do so many people want and defend the idea that only the original autographs, only the original, head, the first letter Paul wrote was inspired and corrected without error, but everything after that, I don't know. Because they have an innate desire to want to exalt the flesh. Go to Hebrews chapter number 4. Hebrews chapter number 4. So again, according to these people, no copies are inspired. Who in here has a copy of the Word of God today? 
everyone. And what's funny about that is that they have copies too, don't they? Their NIV, their ESV is a copy. And one of their big, you know, things that they like to talk about is, well, you know, our uh, modern versions came from more reliable, older manuscripts. Oh, you like the older stuff? Why is your church set up like the course of the world? Okay, well, why does your music sound like the same music you hear at the store? Why, you know, the King James, like Pastor Anderson said, is that classic. Why, why, why do you shun that if you're all about the old stuff? But apparently no copies are inspired, which is crazy because, you know, as I was writing this, you know, I copied and paste from Google Docs. So is that less powerful than like my printed book copy? I, like, how does that really work? Okay, th these, these are little things they just can't answer and, and don't want to answer, by the way. Hebrews 4, verse 12, look at this. For the word of God is, okay, is, not was, is quick and what? Powerful. Quick. What does that mean, quick? I mean, it's alive. Yeah, it, it, it's, it, it's alive. Quick and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword. Which is why <laughs> you have situations like this. Why you have a freak show out here. And sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to the dividing asunder of soul and spirit, and the joints and marrow, and as a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. So the reality is, according to them, that no one has authority because no one has the original manuscript and we're just all the same. Okay? But again, the goal for us is to make sure that they know that is not true. We don't let them hold that position. Okay? You're not going to bring us down to your level by saying that because you are something only. <laughs> you're either truth only or you're falsehood only. You're either King James only or you are manuscript, or original manuscript only, or modern version only, however you want to put it. Go to 1 John chapter number 2. 1 John chapter number 2. And of course, this also means that we can't be held to any kind of standard, which is why they embrace the don't judge philosophy. I, I mean, look, you ask, I mean, you, you probably heard it walking in here. Yeah, how dare you judge me? Don't judge me. Don't judge us. <laughs> okay? It's the same thing the new evangelicals say. You knock on a door. Hey, you're 100% sure if you die today, you'd go to heaven? That, I just find that really offensive and just very judgmental how you could ask that. First time somebody got super mad at me was in Vancouver. <laughs> it was around here. Okay? And I'll never forget it. You know, because according to them, we don't have the original autographs. We don't have the original manuscripts. And therefore, we're all the same. We're all equal. And we're not going to be punished. We're not, there's no consequences. No judgment. Planet fitness, Christianity. It, it is what you have. Where man is the authority and God is not. I mean, think about it. Why is it that there's so many? I mean, you, you do hear the word of God. You're, not, you're probably knocking so-called Christians' doors all the time around here. I know we do in Boise all the time. Okay? And people are hearing the word of God. They're, they're, they're telling us things about the Bible, but they don't ever do anything. Right? They don't ever do anything with it. Why? But it, it's simple to understand why. They don't believe it. They just don't believe it. Their, their, their pastors are sowing doubt on a weekly basis to their congregations, and the people are just in this web. They're in this snare of the devil, right? And it, it's our job to get them out. Yeah. But it's also our job to fight those people that, like I said, they're cemented. They're not coming out. They're, they're given over. Okay, the, 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 the James Whites of the world, you know, the, the, those types of people, and there's tons of them out there. I can't think of all their names right now. But it's our job to combat them, okay, by straightening people out in the community, you know, getting people saved and getting them on fire, hopefully, and trying to edify them and tell them the truth. And hopefully, you know, if somebody doesn't have time, you've got something quick you could say to them to make them think and to understand, hey, you know, this King James only thing is not the boogeyman that your pastor told you it was because your church, your pastor is something only as well. So you're in 1 John chapter number 2, look at verse 27. Okay, because according to them, you need man. Because you don't have a book without error. If you got a copy, it could have errors and it's not inspired. 
But 1 John chapter 2 and verse 27 says, But the anointing which ye have received, okay, th this is John, the Apostle John, talking to his converts, but the anointing which ye have received of him abideth in you. What's that anointing? What, what, what's in, abiding in them? It's the Word of God. And ye need not that any man teach you, but as the same anointing teacheth you of all things, and is what? Truth. And is no lie. And even it hath taught you. Ye shall abide in him. Now, did the Apostle John have the original autographs? Hey, did he have the original Genesis, the original Exodus, the very first copies? No. Those were long gone by then. So what does the Bible say about itself? Does the Bible claim that it's inspired? Does the Bible claim that it's scripture? What does all this mean? Go to 2 Timothy chapter number 3. And let's answer a couple of questions. And the first one is, do you, with your printed copy, you're on your phone, do you have the scriptures? Is it inspired? Do you know what the Bible says about this? Let's answer these questions. 2 Timothy chapter 3, very famous verse. We've already looked at this before, but let's look at it again. Look at verse 16. 2 Timothy 3, verse 16. All Scripture. Just, 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 just those two words, all Scripture. It sounds like what Paul is saying is that there's Scripture. Okay? All Scripture is given by inspiration of God. Remember the two religions. You have human achievement, which pushes do or doing. Whereas divine accomplishment, what Jesus did for us, pushes what? Done. Salvation. Gift. Okay? Notice that contrast. Notice the difference there. Okay, the Bible says of itself, all scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness. And notice what it doesn't say in this next verse here. It doesn't say anything about manuscripts or autographs. Is the word manuscript in the Bible? No. <laughs> Isn't that funny? Verse 17. That the man of God may be perfect, thoroughly furnished unto all good works. So Paul tells Timothy, the pastor, the elder Timothy, all scripture is given by inspiration of God. What is scripture? Let's go back and look at the first time that it's mentioned in the Bible. Turn to Daniel chapter number 10. And let's see what the Bible says about it. Daniel chapter number 10. So I'm just going to summarize it here. Daniel chapter 10, Daniel has received a vision. And in that chapter you learn that there's a decent amount of time from the time that he gets the vision and his prayers about that vision get answered. The reason for that time lapse is because of spiritual warfare. There is an angel, there is a, uh, which, which Daniel 10 calls a, a certain man, okay, and his face is like lightning, shows up and explains to Daniel that the reason for the delay is because of the spiritual warfare that is taking place. And then he tells Daniel some things that are very interesting here and tells him that he's beloved and that he's going to receive help and that he's going to get his prayers answered. And look at verse number 21, okay? And this is where we're going to see the first mention of the word scripture here. Look what it says. Daniel chapter 10, verse 21. But I, and this is that angel speaking there. He says, but I will show thee that which is noted in the scripture of truth. Okay, what did we start the sermon off with? Psalm 100, verse 5. We know that his truth endureth to all generations. Okay, he says the scripture of truth. So this angel says, hey, I'm going to show you what is noted in the scripture of truth. Where do you think this angel came from? Yeah, heaven. Okay, and look what he says next. And there is none that holdeth with me in these things. These things are what? What, is these, what? what are these things he's talking about? The scriptures, okay? Which is where his vision came, uh, came from. And he says, none holdeth with me in these things, but Michael, your prince. Interesting, okay? 
in, in the midst of spiritual warfare, okay, in, in the midst of, of, of this angel trying to get to Daniel, okay, the, the, the dark side was able to stall, able to hold him up. But when he gets there, he says, okay, that was that. But when it comes to the scripture of truth, nobody can hold me in these things but Michael the prince. And who's Michael? He's a good guy. He's on the side. Michael the archangel. He, he's on, obviously, the, the side of, of righteousness. So what does this mean? Well, this means that the scripture comes from where? It comes from heaven. So this angel is taking what the scripture says from heaven and bringing it down to earth to give to Daniel so that he can write it down for the future, for the latter times. Because he says, hey, write these things down for the latter days. Meaning what? That God obviously preserves his truth. And if you have a copy of what is said in heaven, guess what? You've got the scripture. Yeah. So that printed copy that you have in your lap or on your phone is scripture. Timothy had the scriptures. You have the scriptures. The original manuscript onlyest, the Omo, hath not the scriptures. Go to Psalm chapter 119. Should have told you to keep something there, but we're going to go to Exodus 32 after this. Psalm 119. Again, another famous, familiar verse. I love this verse. Verse 89. Forever, O Lord, thy word is settled in heaven. And that's where the originals are. So unless you're talking to somebody who claims to have a near-death experience and went up there and saw the original book, and actually, i got to make some corrections. You have the originals. You have, you have the copy. You have a copy of that. You have the scripture. You have what was given to you by God. Given to you by God. Forever. What does forever mean? Everlasting. Eternal. That's right. Okay. Eternity past, eternity present, eternity future. That's how God's word expands. That's, that's how it exists. So the originals are in heaven. So the very first letter that Paul ever wrote, the very first time James wrote James, okay, guess what? That wasn't the original. That in and of itself was a copy. Go to Exodus chapter 32 and take a look at this. For the Lord is good, His mercy is everlasting, and His truth endures to all generations. We looked yesterday at the book of Jeremiah and how when the king, Jehoiakim, uh, he, he burned the scroll and just tossed it in the fire. Right? Pastor Menes explained to us how, you know, what happened. Was the original lost? No. God said, I'll just write another one. We'll actually add to it. You know, I'll give you more of the scripture from up here to condemn him. Okay? And, to, and, and to record this event here. Exodus 32, look at verse number 15. So obviously God uh, uh, communicating with Moses, trying to establish the nation of Israel here. Exodus 32, let's look at some originals. Verse 15. So God's telling him, hey, you better get down from the mountain because these people just corrupted themselves. And Moses is like, well, you know, <laughs> I, I, I don't think it's as bad. But look at verse 15. Exodus 32, verse 15. And Moses turned. So God tells him, hey, you better get down there because they've already turned aside. And Moses turned and went down from the mountain. And the two tables of the testimony were in his hand. The tables were written on both sides, on the one side and on the other were they written? Verse 16. And the tables were the work of God, and the writing was the writing of God graven upon the tables. Okay, so as God is writing Scripture on these tables, okay, He is writing from the settled record, the settled word, the already established word that is in heaven. And He's giving them what is sufficient for them in their time in history, in their time in life. Okay, but uh, go to Exodus chapter number 34. And we'll look at verse number one. Because what happens after this? Well, Moses comes down the mountain. He's got the, he's got the tablets. He's like, this is great. I can't believe I had this experience. And then he realizes, wait a second. What God just told me about these people turning aside to idolatry is true. And what does he do? 
He breaks the tablets. He's just like, wow, he just throws them. He's just so shocked, so upset, so angry. So Moses thus becomes the first person to break the scriptures, if you will. And what happens? The original's lost? No. Look at verse number one. Exodus 34. Here's round two. Exodus 34, verse number one. And the Lord said unto Moses, Hew thee two tables of stone like unto the first. And I will write upon these tables the words that were in the first tables, which thou breakest. Okay? He's like, don't worry, I'll take care of it. I will write the same things on these tables to be the same copies as the ones that you just broke. So what does this mean? Even if man destroys a copy of the Bible, guess what? God can just bring it right back. That's what that means. Okay? That also means that man cannot break the scriptures eternally, forever. Man is not going to be able to overpower God in his will. And what's his will? His will is that truth would endureth to all generations. Okay? That is what it is. Go to 2 Peter. I'm sorry. Go to Deuteronomy chapter 17. Deuteronomy chapter number 17. Deuteronomy chapter 17. Okay, God is telling Moses, you know, I want you to let these people know, these stiff-necked people know, that there's coming a day where they're not going to like the system that I gave them. They're not going to like this freedom. They're not going to like the system of judges. And they're going to want a king. And I've got some rules for this king. I've got something that this king ought to do to help him and to help you. And let's look at what it is. Deuteronomy 17, verse 18. So it says this, And it shall be when he, meaning their future king, sitteth upon the throne of his kingdom, that he shall write him a what? A copy of this law in a book. Funny how he uses the word book there. Not manuscript. I wonder if God did that on purpose, just because of the future, you know. Write him a copy of this law in a book, out of that which is before the priests, the Levites. Verse 19. And it shall be with him. And he shall read therein all the days of his life that he may learn to fear the Lord his God to keep all the words of this law and these statutes to do them. Verse 20, that his heart be not lifted up above his brethren. Anybody here ever notice how puffed up and prideful these omos are? How arrogant they come across? Oh, but she just don't understand textual criticism and this and that. I understand that you can shut your mouth. That's what I understand. How about you shut up? Because I don't want to hear you anymore. You're a liar. You are a robber and a thief. And I'm going to prove that to you. That is what you are. But what does this mean here? This means that God gave man not only permission to copy, but the command to copy. That's what that means. We have permission and a command because the Bible says that we are kings and priests. Now, luckily, the way we copy is we just go down and buy, you know, the King James or you just download it on your phone. But that's the same. That's cool. But I, I will tell you, you know, if you take, take time, here, here's a good challenge for you. Here's something that, I, I, that, that, that will really help you out. Take a passage of Scripture. If you, if you preach, take your soul winning verses and just write them out by hand. Just write them out by hand. Check your work. Write them out by hand. And your level of understanding will definitely skyrocket. Here, here's another one. The next month it has 31 days. Write, uh, like on day one, you know, on the first, go to Proverbs chapter one and just copy down Proverbs chapter one. Do that for a month and then tell me how your Christianity, tell me how your faith, tell me how your walk with God's going after that month. Okay? Do it. Trust me. You will not be disappointed. Go to uh, 2 Peter chapter number one. 2 Peter chapter number one. It sounds to me like the majority of professing Christianity today is not only out to lunch, but just downright stupid. Okay? I mean, it, th this is just absurd. I mean, we've already seen clear examples in the Bible that man cannot overpower God. Man cannot lose the Bible, lose the Word of God in translation because his truth endureth unto all generations. And not just in the English language, like we've already heard this weekend. Amen. To all languages of the earth. Second Peter chapter number 1, look at verse 21. For the prophecy 
came not in old time by the will of man. Okay, again, the true Bible puts the will of man, puts man down here in God where he belongs above us. Not by the will of man, but holy men of God spake as they were moved by the Holy Ghost. This means that Timothy had copies, and those copies were referred to as Scripture. Meaning what? Well, we have the Scriptures. Go back to 2 Timothy chapter number 3. And look at verse number 15. Look at what Paul says about the Scripture regarding Timothy's life. 2 Timothy chapter 3, look at verse 15. In that from a child thou hast known the holy scriptures, which are able to make thee wise unto salvation through faith which is in Christ Jesus. Now if you were able to insert yourself into this conversation as it was taking place in real time. Paul's actually writing this and Tim, you know Timothy gets it and he's reading this here. Do you think that Timothy had the original scriptures that, he, that were originally written down in Hebrew? No. But because of the diligence in copying and because we know that God preserves his truth, he had the scriptures. Those copies that he had were scripture, meaning sanctified, sacred, holy, different than your, uh, your books of today, different than Moby Dick, different than whatever popular books are out there written by man. Okay? They are scriptures. They are separate. They are given by God. Look at verse 16. All scripture. So those copies that helped him when he was a child, those copies that he's known since his childhood, Okay, those copies that Paul says are able to make thee wise, he says, all scripture, those are scripture, those are sacred, is what? Given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness. So if what you hold in your hand is uh, an NIV or ESV or one of these, you know, lines of modern versions that obviously goes back to the corrupted, you know, line, you, in your, you're you're in, a, in a place that teaches you that only the originals are without error. Why would you apply anything to your life? You know, you're not going to be looking at that stuff like, this is really profitable for doctrine and correction. You're going to be like, oh, this sounds like a good concept, but I'm going to go see what someone else on YouTube has to say about it. I'm going to go check this. I'm going to go check that. Okay, you're not going to hold this like Paul's telling Timothy to hold this. Look at verse 17. That the man of God may be perfect or complete. Thoroughly furnished unto all good works. Go to Job chapter 32 real quick. Job chapter 32. So if Timothy had the scriptures, then that means the Ethiopian eunuch in Acts chapter 8, who was reading a copy of Isaiah, had what? That means he had the scriptures. Because when uh, Philip came up to him, the Bible says that he began at the scripture that he was reading and preached unto him Jesus. That means that the Bereans, who we're told are more noble than those in Thessalonica, they had the scriptures, the sacred writings, the living, the God-breathed words from the settled record in heaven. So let's just real quickly, we, we, we understand scripture now. We, we, we got that down. We understand what that means. We, we've talked about inspiration a lot this weekend, but just real quickly, look at Job chapter 32, verse 8. Inspiration, that word is mentioned two times in the Bible. It's mentioned here. It's also mentioned, obviously, we just read it in 2 Timothy 3. Okay? And I want you to notice there's two words that, that, uh, that, that or there's a word that, that follows this. Let's just read it here. Look at verse 8. It says, but there is a spirit in man. And the inspiration of the Almighty giveth them understanding. So you know what I, when, when I take that and I read that verse, but there is a spirit in man, and the inspiration of the Almighty giveth them understanding. And then I think about, you know, 2 Timothy chapter 3 in verse 16, all scripture is given by inspiration of God. That means that the word of God is given to us through God. He's the source. It's given to us from him, not man. See, the almost want you to believe that they're the ones giving you your truth. They're the ones giving you something that resembles scripture. Go to uh, 1 Thessalonians chapter number 2. 
And anyways, back there in, in that verse, I mean, God's just simply saying that he's given mankind life. He's given, you know, he breathed the breath of life into man. So, for example, you don't have to turn there, but Genesis 2, verse 7 says, And the Lord God formed man of the dust of the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and man became a living soul. How's that? God inspired the flesh. God inspired his creation. I mean, he, he gave us life. He gave us life. Well, it's funny. He gave mankind life. He's the reason why your heart is beating this morning. Those same words, given and inspiration, are also used in reference to the scriptures, the copies that you and I have. So that means that this book is living, unless you go to an Elmo church, which is one letter short of that church out there. So the scriptures meaning uh, that they're alive. What you have is alive. Look at, look at this. 1 Thessalonians chapter number 2. 1 Thessalonians chapter number 2. Verse 13 says this. For this cause also thank we God without ceasing, because when you received the word of God which ye heard of us, you received it not as the word of man. If you're sitting in an Omo church, you're receiving that word as the word of man, because that's what he's literally telling you. He's telling you, well, in the original manuscripts, this phrase was not there. We can't find it. How heartbreaking is that? That is heartbreaking. That is so sad. This is so frustrating. And who's being commended here? These people who received it as the word of God as opposed to the word of man. It says, but as it is in what? Truth. The word of God. You notice that concept, right? Truth, word of God, truth, word of God, from God. You don't find that in the religion of human achievement in their little sections that are out there. So he says, but as it is in truth, the word of God, which effectually worketh also in you that believe, worketh, meaning work and work and work, ongoing. How can that be? Because it's alive. It is eternal. It is from everlasting. That is why those copies are what work. Reading those copies that we have is what works in us on a daily basis. Go to James chapter number one. We're getting kind of close to being done here. James chapter number one. So we understand the definite inspiration. We, we talked about that yesterday. Pastor Menace taught us about that yesterday. And it's so important that we understand it and that we're able to communicate that to people. Let them know this is a living book. Look at your, look at your church's statement of faith. It's, it's, it's way different than what we're saying. It's way different than what the Bible says. The Bible says of itself that it's alive, that it's from God, plain and simple. That's it. What your denomination or what your church or whatever it is is saying is the exact opposite, that man is literally above God. Look at James chapter 1 and verse 21. Wherefore, lay apart all filthiness and superfluity of naughtiness and receive with meekness the engrafted word which is able to save your souls. The engrafted word. This word is engrafted. What, what, what does that mean? Transplantable, living, meaning when you allow this word and you receive it with meekness. Obviously, when you give this to somebody who's not saved and they receive it with meekness, they, they, they believe it, they're saved. It becomes it becomes part of them. It's what places them into the body of Christ. I mean, we, we get that. But what about the saved Christian? Well, it's able to save you from a lot of trouble, isn't it? <laughs> because you could receive these things with meekness. So engrafted, okay? The definition, to become grafted or begin functioning normally. The, for, and they, they give an example here in the dictionary. The transplanted bone marrow engrafted successfully. Okay, so just like how people get skin grafts or they get organ transplants, you know, one person to another, that's how the Bible describes itself. That's how the Word of God describes itself. Unless you're an homo, then it can't be alive. It can't be engrafted because only that original autograph, only that original handwritten manuscript was without error and inspired. That is what they teach and that is what they say. 1 Peter chapter number 1. 1 Peter chapter number 1.
Verse 23. Being born again, not of corruptible seed. Now, I, I get a lot of times we, we talk about that, you know, how they've corrupted the Word of God in, in these modern versions are a, a lot of times a corrupted seed. But really, he's saying born, being born again, not of corruptible seed. So we're not born again by the seed of man, just being born in the flesh, okay? So being born again, not of corruptible seed, but of incorruptible. And what is that incorruptible seed? So you have this corruptible seed, which is us, which is the old man, which is the flesh which is the ruler and reigner of the religion of human achievement, which accepts the almost, which accepts this. He says, but of incorruptible by the word of God, which what? Liveth and abideth forever. It lives because it's living and it abides forever. Go to John chapter one. And I promise I'm getting close to being done. John chapter number one. Look at verse 11. John chapter 1, verse 11. Talking about Christ. He came unto his own, and his own received him not. But as many as received him, to them gave he power to become the sons of God, even to them that believe on his name. Which, and, and here it is, verse 13, which were born not of blood, nor the will of the flesh, Okay, so we don't get into heaven because we're just physically here, just all dogs go to heaven, just everybody goes to heaven, just because you're special and you're you and there's something just, just special about you. You know, I've heard this, I heard this the other day. You know, somebody told me, you know, all of mankind's created in the image of God. Why would he throw somebody in hell? Well, I brought him to this verse right here. Just because you're alive and breathing and you believe whatever you want doesn't give you, you're not that special. It doesn't give you an automatic pass to heaven. It's not how this works. It's what this says. Which we're born talking about the children of God, which were born not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh. Okay, the will of the flesh. Look at what I'm doing. Look at what I do. Look at what I have achieved. It means nothing without Christ. Nothing. Nor the will of man, but of God. Okay, we know, very first verse. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God. Okay, Jesus is the Word. Now go to John chapter number 8. John chapter number 8. Now let's finalize what all of this means. Well, I already said, guess what? You don't need the originals to have the Scriptures. You don't need the originals to have the Scriptures. Your copy, what we have today, is Scripture. The King James Bible is Scripture in the English language. This is, this is scripture. This is inspired. This was given to us by God. This, I believe this conference was given to us by God. Made possible by Him. John chapter 8, verse 47. He that is of God heareth God's words. How's that to simplify things even further? The reason why the Elmo can't hear this truth is because they're not of God. He that is of God heareth God's word. Well, we have people of God today, so that means that God obviously preserved his words Amen. so that we can hear them. Ye therefore hear them not, because you're not of God. Now go to John chapter number 10. Because I already mentioned this. What I believe these homos are, and I wish I could use stronger language, <laughs> they are thieves. They're literally stealing the word of God from humanity. That's what they're doing. They're crooks. They are professional crooks. They are stealing, and, and, and honestly, they're spiritually murdering people. They are spiritually murdering people, which is why I say once a person gets solidified in that position, and that's what they are forever, okay, they're, once, they're one letter, one letter away from being reprobate, one letter from adding that H to the Elmo. John 10, verse 1. Verily, verily, I say unto you, he that entereth not by the door into the sheepfold, but climbeth up some other way, the same is a thief and a robber. The religion of human achievement is filled with thieves and robbers. Their leadership is filled, this is what they are. Jesus is confirming that for us. They're saying there's this other broad way to get to God. 
You can't just be that narrow, just God preserved his truth. Just rah. Look at verse 10. Jump down to verse 10. The thief cometh not but for to steal and to kill and to destroy. I am come that they might have life and that they might have it more abundantly. Divine accomplishment. It's why we stick to the truth only. That's why we're King James only. Our message is simple. It really is the gospel. It really is good news. You can be saved forever. That's what this book says. And guess what? After you're saved, you've got a guide to help you in every area of your life. But when you belong to that other religion and you're on probation, boy, you're filled with anxiety, aren't you? You're filled with all kinds of problems. Doubt, confusion, just broadness. It's horrible. And you are under the thumb of a crooked thief parole officer. Okay? And it's either the pastor or it's other people in the congregation, the board of deacons. I mean, take your pick. Okay? Like I, unfortunately, I've been to churches before where somebody's like, I want to get baptized. And like, we need to watch you for four months and see and make sure you've done enough stuff to, to, to prove and to warrant that you've repented from enough sins to be saved. You on probation. That ain't good news. I brought this, I, I was talking to this lady a couple weeks ago and I was explaining to her this concept about probation. She's like, I'm on probation right now. She's like, you're right, I'm not free. She's like, I'm better off I'm better off than being in the slammer, is what she said. She's like, but you're right, I'm not free. I'm worried I'm going to do something to mess this up. Okay? And she's like, I need to hear what you have to say. She's like, I never thought of it like that before. I don't know. It helped me out, helped her out. Praise God for that. Yeah. So I'm going to end this right here. Okay? The thief, the human achiever, removes God and inserts man as the authority. That's, I mean, that's what it is. And that's why we need to be upset about this. Okay? I want you to hate this. I want you to let people know, obviously out soul obviously discipling kindly first, you know, the, the truth. But when it comes to those that are just dug in, locked down, they ain't going anywhere, okay, we need to let, push back. Say, hey, Mr. Mocker, you're something only. Don't you mock me. Oh, you're King James only? You're modern version only. You're, you're, you're an homo. You gotta be careful with that one though, okay? Depends on who you're talking to, because they might hear something different. So use that with discretion. You know, it, it's there for you if you need it. If you like it, you want to use it. But obviously, our faith and our religion, okay? There's a reason why we're King James only, because we're truth only. That's the fact. We are truth only, and we need to be proud of that. We need to uh, be able to push that and to let these guys know, you know. Wipe that smug look off your face because you are something only. Let's bow our heads and have a word of prayer. Thank you so much, Lord, for this conference and for everybody who showed up. I just pray that you would um, bless the fellowship after the service, bless tonight's sermon, and we just pray, Lord, that uh, you would deal swiftly with the opposition outside. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. Alright, our last song will be song number 121, Like a River Glorious. And before we start this song, if you guys have any questions for Pastor Jones, make sure you send them into the group or write them on paper and turn them into one of the ushers. <clears throat> song number 121, Like a River Glorious. Song number 121, let's sing it together on the first. Like a river glorious is God's perfect peace over all victorious in its bright increase. Perfect yet it floweth fuller every
of his blessed hand. Never foe can follow, never traitor stand. Not a surge of worry, not a shade of care, not a blast of scene so again if you guys have any questions for pastor jones make sure you write them down or you post them in the group have a little 10 minute intermission and then uh we'll gather everybody back to ask the questions brother robert you want to answer in a word of prayer The one for the night, well, let me see, I'll just this. It's um, 43, we're marching to Zion, 412, onward Christian soldiers, 410, faith is the victory, and then 353 for every sort of way to blow. So, we'll practice them before the next service. Uh, what time is the next service, do you know? Oh, is it okay? So just 30 minutes before, maybe 45 minutes before, we'll 